Welcome to the League of Nerds comic book segment number 64. I'm John Cooney here to talk to you about comics released the 24th of April 2013. Beginning as usual with my first five, meaning these are the first five books I intend to read this week, and I'll give a little more depth on them, starting with number one, Guardians of the Galaxy number two. While London deals with the brutal Badoon invasion, the fate of the Guardians of the Galaxy may have been decided millions of miles away. Series writer Brian Michael Bendis told USA Today about the Guardians, starting with Star-Lord, quote, You look at Star-Lord and once you find his origin story, there you go. Man, he's our Luke Skywalker. That's our Peter Parker right there, close quote. Next, he explained Drax, quote, In a fight, he's amazing, but in between those fights, not only does he not know what to do with himself, but there are constantly people challenging him or trying to make their name on him, close quote. He went on with Gamora saying she's, quote, just a woman who thinks her father is a monster and is going to do whatever she can to stop it, close quote. And he finished with Rocket, Raccoon, and Groot saying, quote, Rocket's got a whole thing going on in his past and it's all messed up and he's the only one of his kind. It's hilarious how much you end up caring about him and how much he cares about Groot makes you care about him. You start with the gag, then all of a sudden they're the heart and soul of the piece, close quote. Series artist Stephen McNiven adds, quote, both Rocket and Groot are interesting challenges for me as they move into cartooning, which is an area that I don't venture into much, keeping things relatively realistic in my work, close quote. Bendis says of McNiven's art, quote, You look at his characters and they look like they're thinking, like something's going on behind their eyes, close quote. At number two, we've got Jupiter's Legacy number one. The comic book event of 2013 finally arrives as superstar creators Mark Millar and Frank Quietly give us the superhero epic that all future comics will be measured by. The world's greatest heroes have grown old, and their legacy is a poisonous one to the children who will never live up to their remarkable parents. Unmissable. Series writer Mark Millar explains, quote, This story is my love letter to America. That idea of democracy and everyone having an equal say is such a fundamentally decent one and something we should cherish. You only have to look around the world to see that democracy isn't something to take for granted. I don't mean that in a partisan way, left or right. It's very hard not to be impressed by the fundamental ideals of America. And for me, the United States has always been tied up with superheroes as well. Maybe that's because Wonder Woman and Superman are wearing the American flag. It seems a nice analogy to tie in the end of the American Empire with the big, grand twilight of the superheroes kind of story. It's very, very much a superhero event. Marvel and DC have their various events this year, and I'm planning on blowing them both away with this. I see this as a big, creator-owned superhero event. Nobody's tried anything like this before. For, but it's a big thing, covering a huge time period with tons of characters and tons of dramatic twists. Like I said, this is my love letter to America and everything I like about America. America had its problems, but this is my way of reminding you what's cool about America. It's very timely. This story couldn't have been done five years ago. It's straight out of the headlines of today. Close quote. At number three, we've got East of West number two, Sons of Prophecy. Following the high crimes in the debut issue of East of West, the fallout spreads across the broken nations of America. Forces aligned to stave off the apocalypse, while equally powerful ones do everything they can to bring it to pass. One of the most exciting new books of the year, this is East of West, a brand new ongoing monthly book from the award-winning team of Marvel's FF, Jonathan Hickman and Nick Dragota. Series writer Jonathan Hickman explained the book, Quote, it's a book with big touchstones that resonate, a shared mythology that everyone can immediately click into, and a visual aesthetic that somehow manages to be both commercial and a bit off-center at the same time. So interesting. East of West is also a book of big themes and big characters, something that's always nice. But in its simplest, most distilled form, it's a love story that takes place at the end of the world. Close quote. Series artist Nick Dragota describes the feel of the book. Quote, For me, the sci-fi western vibe is apt. It's that Hickman bent where he plays with history, creates new mythologies, and then just sees where it goes. It feels very much like an alternate American future. What if the Civil War never ended? What would be the repercussions of that as we move forward? Close quote. Number four, we've got Uncanny X-Men number five. Frazier Irving of Batman and Robin joins the creative team of Uncanny X-Men. Learn what it's like to be a student at Cyclops' new school. Series writer Brian Michael Bendis explained why he's excited for the new artists as we start the second arc. Quote, The first issues of Uncanny X-Men are dealing a lot with what's going on with Emma and Cyclops, but with this big hint that something's going on with magic that's not normal. 
boom, here it is. And isn't Fraser just the guy to draw that kind of stuff? We're going to delve into what's going on with magic and her powers and her place in the mutant world, and who better than the amazing artist of Shade to show us some awesome Marvel magic, close quote. Series artist Fraser Irving is also excited, but for a different reason, quote, maybe I'm a little excited about drawing magic because I also fancied her back in the day, close quote. And at number 5, we've got Wolverine and the X-Men number 28. Dog Logan, Wolverine's half-brother from the classic origin, has defeated Wolverine and taken charge of the Jean Grey school students, which student won't be coming home. Series writer Jason Aaron responded to suggestions that the book has taken a more serious turn in this arc. Quote, In my mind, it doesn't change anything, certainly not in terms of tone. Even though the book is lighthearted, it's definitely not a kid's book. There's still the occasional issue where one of our characters gets shot in the head. It's always been a book with real consequences, a book that can veer from being silly and fun to dark and serious. That's not going to change. And certainly I'm digging into Wolverine origin during the second issue of this arc, which is gorgeously painted by Ramon Perez with awesome colors by Laura Martin. It really looks at the whole origin story from Dog's perspective because he was kind of the forgotten man in that story. It really looks at him as a powerful, tragic figure. And in terms of how this fits into what Wolverine and the X-Men have always been about, in my mind, this book has always been about family. It's about kids coming of age. It's about parents coming of age. So certainly having Wolverine's brother stumble into the middle of all of that ties into that theme. We've got a lot of warped family relationships among the characters in this book, so this is just another one to throw into the mix. Close quote. Rounding out the top ten at number six from IDW, we've got Highways number four of four by John Byrne. Many secrets hide in the asteroid belt, and our crew have just found themselves thrust into the biggest one of all. Questions will be answered, but some of those answers may turn out to be questions of their own. At number seven, from Image, we've got Invincible number 102 by Robert Kirkman. It's Nolan versus Throg on the surface of the moon as still more secrets about the Voltramite Empire are revealed. At number eight, from DC, we've got Before Watchmen Comedian number six of six with a historical pull quote from Andrew West recording of the assassination of Robert Kennedy. Been shot. Is that possible? Is that possible? It's good. Is it possible, ladies and gentlemen? It is possible. He has... At number 9 from Image, we've got Morning Glories number 26, The Waiting Game. Season 2 of the smash hit series begins here with a special full-sized and possibly priced $1 prelude, the perfect jumping on point for collection readers looking to move to single issues. And at number 10 from Dark Horse, we've got the massive number 11. Following a mutiny, the crew of the Capitol are in a race against time to catch their increasingly elusive sister ship, the Massive, when a school of aggressive great white sharks cross their path. For the best of the rest this week from DC, we've got Batman Incorporated number 10. When only one can survive, which will it be, the man or the bat? And we've got Batman the Dark Knight number 19. Where is Batman when Gotham City is being destroyed? We've also got Flash number 19. What is the latest and greatest threat to the Flash and all those closest to him? Next, we've got Fury of Firestorm the Nuclear Man number 19. What's more deadly to fire than a killer frost? And we've got Katana number 3, if Katana's sword is shattered, whose souls are escaping? We've also got Superman number 19, who is the one person with the power to turn Wonder Woman against Superman. Next we've got Talon number 7, if the Court of Owls isn't responsible for killing Talon, then who is? And last we've got Teen Titans number 19, which new member the Teen Titans reveals his true colors. Now, in case you're wondering why all these solicits sound like questions from Jeopardy, it's because of the fold-out covers that give you the answers. From Marvel this week, we've got Avengers number 10, Validator. We learned that the Canadian super team Omega Flight got lost in a Garden Origin site. Discover what happens when the Avengers go to rescue them. Learn why adaptation is the scariest word in the Marvel Universe. Next, we've got Avengers Arena number 8. A new story arc begins. What are X-23 secrets? And what is Darkhawk's big reveal? It's two chances in one month to discover why AI fanboy calls Avengers Arena, quote, a ton of fun, close quote, and IGN promises that, quote, you will be convinced this series is taking the kid gloves off, close quote. Next, we've got Fantastic Four number seven. You've seen how everything begins. Now see how everything ends. Marvel's first family travels to the big crunch. What if the end of the universe wasn't really the end of everything? What happens beyond the end of infinite time and space? Speaking of ends, how's everybody feeling out there in time and space, Dr. Richards? Hmm? Next, we've got FF number 6, Darla vs. Yancey Street. Enough said. We've also got Gambit number 11. When Gambit's in over his head, who will answer his call for help? Enter Rogue, and she may just have an opinion or two about Gambit's extracurricular activities. 
Speaking of, Joelle has her own dark designs for Gambit's former flame. We've also got Morbius the Living Vampire number 4. After killing the Godfather of Brownsville, Morbius incites a gang war. Will Morbius be able to protect his new friends, or will he give in to the monster? Find out why Morbius is the breakout hit of Marvel now. Next, we've got New Avengers number 5, Black Swan. Learn the history of the enigmatic Black Swan. What answers can she provide the Illuminati? And watch as the New Avengers do the unthinkable. We've also got Ultimate Comics Spider-Man number 22, Venom vs. Spidey, The Final Showdown. How's Gwen Stacy figure into it, and how will it change her and Miles' life forever? Guest starring Mary Jane Watson. Next, we've got Uncanny Avengers number 7, Enter the Apocalypse Twins. The beginning of the end begins with their arrival. Why do they seek to anger the Celestials? What is their connection to Kang? How is Thor responsible for their mighty power? A death at the hands of an Avenger divides the team. Will Sunfire torture an S-Man to save mutant lives? And last, we've got Young Avengers number 4, Kate Bishop finally turns up. A lovely day trip to Central Park for a group of cheery youngsters. Lies. It's not lovely as they're being pursued by bad guys, and it's not a day trip as it's, well, night. A shameless retcon into Marvel Boys history. From Boom Studios, we've got Deathmatch number 5, brand new arc, perfect jumping on point for new readers. The second round of the ultimate Deathmatch begins here. Which fan-favorite characters are on a collision course, and what does last month's shocking reveal mean for the Rat and Maturian? The mysteries grow deeper, and the casualty list grows longer as Deathmatch continues. From Dynamite Entertainment, we've got Bionic Woman number 9. Jamie has a war on her hands when a wave of fembots launch an all-out attack on the Russian mob, the Russian government, and pretty much everything Russian. But which side of the war will the Bionic Woman choose, and how will her new abilities affect the fight? From Image Comics, we've got Clone Number 6, a new story arc. Luke Taylor's true nature has been revealed, but his fight to rescue his wife and newborn daughter back is just beginning. Now that Beta and the second generation of clones have been unleashed, how can Luke survive against his younger, stronger, more ruthless self? Next, we've got I Love Trouble Number 5. Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. Things just aren't going well for Felicia when she starts experiencing breaks with reality after her work as an assassin begins to take an emotional toll. Doesn't help that she finds out just how deep Johnny's betrayal goes, either. We've also got Lost Vegas number 2. The clock has started. Roland has 24 hours to make his move, but when he uncovers the darkest secret of Las Vegas, will the information help him, or will he be in even more danger? Hint, let's go with more danger. The Eisner Award-winning team of Jim McCann and Janet Lee reunite to create a universe filled with intrigue and a high-stakes heist. And we've got Manhattan Project's number 11, Building. Following the dramatic events of the Logic Revolution, what will the science lords of Manhattan Projects do with an Earth they now completely control? Nothing good. The thrilling feel-good bad science series continues in the Manhattan Project's number 11, Building. And out in trades this week from Image, we've got Invincible, the Ultimate Collection, Volume 8 hardcover. In the aftermath of the Viltrumite War, friends become enemies, enemies become allies, and Mark Grayson's future as Invincible ends here. Collects Invincible number 85 to 96. And we've got Morning Glories, Volume 4, Truant's trade paperback. Still reeling from the climactic events of P.E., the Glories find themselves lost in time and space, confronted by a new group of students who might be even more dangerous than the faculty themselves, the Truants. Questions are answered, and new mysteries emerge as Season 1 comes to a shocking end. Collects Morning Glories number 20 to 25. And from Marvel, we've got Squadron Supreme, trade paperback in a new printing. On an Earth much like our own, the world's greatest superhuman champions are confronted by a society in ruins. Faced with the possibility of a new dark age for mankind, they choose the only course available to them and take control of the world's governments themselves. Now they have one year in which to completely restructure human society. Can their plan succeed? Will a renegade member bring about their downfall? And what will happen when the Earth's mightiest heroes find themselves becoming instead its all-powerful totalitarian overlords? Before Watchmen, before Marvels, before Kingdom Come, there was Squadron Supreme a deconstructionist parable of the superhero paradigm in a real-world setting considered by many to be the late Mark Grunewald's finest work. Collect Squadron Supreme number 1 through 12 and Captain America number 314. Okay, so that's just a few of my favorite books out this week. There's still plenty of others available, and I broke out all the Marvel titles this week into their own video, as well as a separate video for all of DC, and even a video with all the top independent publishers. You can find them all on my YouTube channel at he'sgotissues.com. We'll also have a link up on theleagueofnerds.com, our Facebook page, so be sure to like us there too. 
Of course, you can follow everything I'm reading on Facebook, Pinterest, or Twitter, and you can find a link to everything at He's Got Issues.com. And a reminder that both He's Got Issues and the League of Nerds are proud members of the Comics Podcast Network. So until next week, I'm John Cooney, and I've got issues. <laughs>